Morning. How's it going? Good morning. How are you all? Doing well, Jay. I was doing well. If you, yeah. Hey, hey, Ramya. Hi, I'm Ramya. Hey. Um, yeah, Hi, so Jay. I was unsure if you're gonna join because the because of the time change, right? Um. So you wanna? Do you want to wait for? Um, sure. Yeah, I'm just basically at the moment um, moving things around on my screen. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Um, and we can get into the book. Yeah, so just to introduce Ramya. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Ramya? Ramya is a friend. Sure. So, yeah, um, I, yeah. I joined last Friday for half an hour. I had to leave early for a office work meeting, but uh, yeah, uh, sh a long story short, I was in Intel for seven years, then quit Intel, went back to grad school for CS. And then for the last two and a half years, I've been working in software in machine learning infrastructure. Wow. Um, yeah, so currently I'm at C3.ai as a software engineer in machine learning infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Um, so what um, makes you want to study this at the moment? Um, for me, I do a lot of uh, client server API creations at work and without understanding the inner details of how things work, I feel it difficult to progress to the next level at work or either even if I'm going to look for a job outside later, like two years from now. I wanted to understand all the details of how the decisions are made, how a data model is implemented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, same thing here, same reason that I started studying this as well is just um, at work, I was challenged to think a lot more about architecture, UML, system design, design patterns. And so these are things that, you know, maybe I looked at a long time ago, but you know, I wanted to just get back into it and really, really like understand it. So I decided, you know, this is the year that I'm actually going to do all that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in but addition to this. Interesting detail is that uh, Vijay is not uh, in the back end. He's, uh, you are a front end um, uh, engineer, right? So I'm so well, I can do full stack. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you do full stack? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I've worked significantly in PHP. Like, so years before I started, um, you know, doing React. So I'm doing React and JavaScript at the moment, but, you know, I had worked a lot in PHP and I understand things like Java Spring and uh, Ruby on Rails. So, so yeah, I do have, um, I have both. I just, if you were to ask me like where my strength is, it's probably more front end because that's where I spent a lot more of my time in my career. And so now, you know, I'm just trying to like, bring it all together. Um, yeah, and so we can start uh, just one thing, like before I like kind of get started too, like I just wanted to say that um, I'm also trying to study data structures and algorithms. And, you know, um, really just, I think that it goes hand in hand with everything that you learn in this book. Um, I think that knowing data structures again, and like how to like make them, um, is really helpful, especially like right here, we have a tree and then like this ch chapter kind of talks a little bit about documents um, versus graphs versus, um, you know, just basically like the different types of um, data models out there and how to like create your own data models. Um, so I felt like it was a good time for me to brush up again on like data structures and algorithms. Um, I don't know if you can see this, sometimes like Zoom hides things, but this is the book that I'm reading. It's called Elements of Programming Interviews. Um, so I have one in Python because everybody writes Python. <laughs> but for me, this actually like makes more sense if I write it in Java because like Java is like a little bit more like the JavaScript and C++ syntax. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you all want to make a study group out of this at some point, let me know. I've got some other friends who are interested in doing this as well. So the thing about the, that subject is that it's only relevant for uh, interviews, and not for day-to-day -day work. Yeah. 
so nobody writes those things in work mm. so this is more like if you already have if you're not looking this is more appropriate because you'll be doing design um but yeah so on that tend data i mean that whatever studying that um, you know interviewing stuff tends to evaporate <laughs> if you just you know stop doing it for a month so um, it's very <laughs> if you have a um if you have a goal in mind like i'm going to interview then yeah it makes sense um yeah so i i would be interested but like maybe um maybe two three months out uh, yeah. because as i said if you stop it like it's all the effort is gone like it's wasted so uh, yeah but yeah Absolutely. so if there is a, a discord uh, thing then you know um you um how uh, is it already on or um are you planning yeah. to start it or what's oh so you mean for uh, data structures and algorithms or are you talking about systems yeah. no data structures so it would be the same channel i just make like another one in here um i try to like do it all inside hack buddy i know that um uh, you know like i kind of tend to promote this a lot but I, i do like feel like it's a free service like i'm not charging anybody for it and so like you know why yeah. not use it you know and so um this is a good place to basically just kind of uh you know network i already got like you know probably like i would say like at least 700 people on this channel so there's a lot of engineers and not all of them are on all, every single time <laughs> like there's probably somebody in here who knows stuff and a lot of people are from like the top companies you want to work at anyway so um it's a good good channel to be a part of um yeah yeah uh, so when um, is there a timeline are you looking to interview is that the uh... so, so for me like i can't publicly say like when i'm going to interview because i would like throw like my company off <laughs> just um but yeah you know like i'm uh, just to kind of say like my own kind of time frame is like i at least like where i'd want a promotion um i'm always looking like every 6 months to a year and so yeah. as i finish out like a year like i always start thinking about okay like what am i competitive to in the marketplace like how much are other people in my position earning and then beyond that i kind of just think about like what's the goal right like where am i like in terms of like my own personal goals so i mean like i'll just briefly share this with you right like just um you know i have like this evernote thing that i keep and like i have like a year planned out for me and i actually kind of start off like with a year goals i kind of say make stuff that's engineering sound and sells really well googly because i hear that term a lot and so i want to understand what that actually means <laughs> um <laughs> so i just kind of like think about that and then you know studying is kind of like a data structure in a way too right like it's a graph there's a lot of nodes that you have to explore so i started thinking about like what's the best way like should i binary you know like it should i mix it into a tree should i mix it into a graph right like so then like i think like how should i traverse it right like breadth first depth first but anyway long story short right like i know that there are things i need to know um so i go through them algorithms data structures leak code design patterns uh brush up on these other things you know and then just the the details kind of come here and every month i just sort of pick one um one to focus on like for the big big uh, goal and then one for just like basic things like um life needs and so i just kind of like plan it out by the year and then hopefully by the end of the year i reach this goal or the next goal or the next goal and so on and that's how i just like eventually i want to be a millionaire that's kind of like something i'm thinking about too <laughs> so how am i going to do it this is all uh, manager stuff i think you should not be an engineer <laughs> person who who categorizes like this should be a manager um <laughs> you could also be a life coach or oh, engineer yeah. well, yeah. but the the thing is right like if you look at a lot of youtubers and like people who are um like at the top of their game teaching coding or like being like you know a coder um expert right life coach or something like that on linkedin or whatever these are people who are really accomplished in their field first off so like that's something that i'm working on right like improving like my own accomplishments and then teaching it that's what i try to do at you know this javascript la group and hack buddy um 
you know, and then the discord channel that you guys are, that you're all in. And so I, I just do that. And then, you know, over time you see like you amass a following, you build something like real world, right? Like something that scales and then you do become a millionaire. You do come like, you know, something. So people at the top of their game are actually millionaires. It's not like something impossible. Like, you know, you just have to like practice at it daily. That's how I look at it at least. Mm. Yeah. Why settle for anything less, right? Like we're all here to become good software engineers. So why not be the best we can actually be? Mm. Yeah. Um, so going back to your data structures question, I would be interested start in maybe in September because that's probably <laughs> when I will be looking. Sure. Um, so, but uh, for now, I aim to finish this with you and uh, kind of um, really, so the thing is not just cracking the interview, right? Like the next step is to actually do good work. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that is, uh, I think at this point, that is more important than like just cracking the interview because um, there's a lot of demand. So I think uh, landing a job is not as hard as it used to be. So anyway. Definitely. Um, yeah, okay. Let's start. So do you remember when we, uh, where we stopped? I think we stopped um, at. Yeah. Uh, ah, so that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. So do you want me to uh, speak or? Are you okay speaking? Yeah, I think um, anything works. I think like um, I'm going to try to just like open it up to more discussion this time. And I feel like because I feel like that's what the t group likes anyway. And um, I've been getting some feedback from like some of the other people who uh, were in our classroom, like Krishna's class. Right. And so I know a lot of them are watching the videos afterwards because they can't make it initially at this time. Um, but they are like starting to, you know, <laughs> get some encouragement, like, you know, add some comments in here. So um, we can try to like, I think like the thing is what I'm trying to say here is essentially that um, if we want to ask a lot of questions um, and we don't get to everything in this section or in this book, you know, we can just keep writing them here. That's totally fine and appropriate. Um, Cause I think like that's the point of the group just to like ask questions and like really make sure we know what we're talking about here. Um, so if we go slow, it's, it is slow. Like you said, I think it's better to go slower than to go fast and then like feel like we didn't learn anything. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm okay to take the time and kind of um, let the data, let the knowledge sink in. Um, okay. So I think, uh, so the last time we spoke about how the document DB um, capitalizes on data locality and um, it, uh, it is ideal for um, nested data structures like uh, where you have one to many, like the uh, uh, book says, right? If mm -hmm. there's a one to many relation in your uh, data, then, and that's how your access pattern is, um, then, uh, document model um, is the is the right way to look at it and uh, the the document dbs are the ones that you should uh, be leveraging uh, but yeah so so yeah so basically what that means is um, over uh, so the the downside of that is when data evolves and it's no more uh, one to many relationship i think that's where um, you will have your performance go down because now your application has to handle that complexity um, uh, and uh, you have to actually implement. So do you understand what I'm saying? Because I have, I have uh, see, um, I've seen the complication happen in our application, like um, in, in my day, day job. So we use a document DB. And uh, so the, since, so when it started out, we thought it will be, we will be only uh, the main use cases actually fetching user information. Uh, but over time, what happened was like, we added a lot of, uh, um, um, a lot of relation kind of stuff around it, like uh, management yeah, yeah, account. Makes sense. And mm -hmm. so now when we have to fetch that information into the profile, we have to actually load to, um, uh, two records separately. There's no join. We have to load the the management account record and the user information record and kind of uh, glue them together. Yeah. So it's kind of um, 
the you know the um, complexity doubled there. So um, so yeah. So basically, also it doesn't um, it does not uh, uh, so use like fetching the user information is a much more uh, a uh, frequent operation than fetching the account, right? So there's a mismatch of uh, traffic distribution also. So some tables get uh, end up getting used a lot and some tables don't, uh, 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 don't, so they don't, so what happens is the, like the management account I was talking about, right? It's not a very high traffic thing, but because of this profile having a dependency on that, we have to allocate sufficient resources to both um, the read capacity and the write capacity has to match the profile table and the account table. So, which is a lot of wasted effort only for like uh, maybe, um, maybe a few, few um, um, data information, we have to fetch the entire record and then, um, so yeah, it's kind of wasteful, um, but yeah. So it's it's hindsight, what we have is, uh, is hindsight. Um, but said that, I don't know if we, we could have used relation uh, relational database either because um, um, because we have come up with approaches to cache the relation the the you know the table that we don't uh, uh, you that with that um, the work the management account table right the record it uh, we don't need all the information in the record we just need a few fields so we kind of cache them so we have come up with alternative approaches um, so. Yeah, I think that is probably the the way to go. So, cache the information that uh, um, uh, that you need, so that you don't have to go to the DB for uh, uh, for the join functionality that you might need in Document DB. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Adam, how did you know that you need a Document DB versus a relational DB when you started your project? I was about to ask that. <laughs> So um, how did you know? So basically, the so that is that is how the um, uh, the use case is the access pattern is right. So it's a it's a chat application. So uh, what we are interested the most frequent information that we'll be looking up is a user information and like the licenses they have stuff like that. So um, the uh, we. Um, we thought like the license information can all be like eventual consistency, right? We would, uh, we would, uh, we would, uh, uh, we would persist the data, um, sync the data in the profiles, um, in the profile, basically user profile from uh, other records. And it does not have to be instantaneous. It can be eventual consistent. So we made that trade off. Um, so it's, um, it is a, I think the answer to that question in short is basically our primary use case is fetching one user information. And uh, um, so we kind of handled the no data normalization, everything else in the, um, in the application. So uh, the fetch, fetch part is optimized. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you wanted to have low latency fetching. So our but you didn't optimize for the correctness right here. It was just yeah. fetch quickly. Yes. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, so basically, for example, license information, right? The license information usually comes to the profile from the management, mm -hmm. from the uh, account, uh, the mm -hmm. customer's uh, primary, like some account, right? So, yeah. and that license information does not have to be um, super accurate. We can, uh, um, it can have eventual consistency. We are okay to live with it. So mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that was the, okay. that was okay. the reason. And it kind of made, uh, um, take, took advantage of uh, uh, the locality and also it made an obvious okay. choice for us. You briefly talked about join. Was join written in some part of your application code because the database yeah, we have naturally doesn't support uh, join or it was part of some service running in the background? No, you like there's no join. You have to basically fetch the record. Fetch the, yeah. So fetch the two records and kind of join in the code. So um, okay. not super uh, super smart, but uh, yeah, we we hit a um, we hit a you know a limit there, and uh, we had to come up with uh, we had to get creative and use um, uh, caching solutions to help with the throttling and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, that was kind of like, they were kind of saying that too in this book, right? Like um, MongoDB or NoSQL and all that. Um, 
sometimes like you know uh it's it's good for just basically like things that are you know um sort of like all together like all the data is in one payload um in a tree structure right like or an object right like if you think of a javascript object um you know like if you have your data pretty much all to ready to go and it isn't it sorted or it isn't like in any kind of like um you know kind of like a relational structure you should be okay using it with your application um kind of like this like if you look at this linkedin example here you can see like this has like a lot of fields together um in like kind of a tree structure the user id the first name last name summary so if you don't have um like very complicated data then maybe json represents like a simpler way to like get that data um and then just let your application handle you know like um organizing it right like um putting it together uh but if it becomes something where you have lots of different entities with lots of different fields and lots of different connections um then they don't really recommend using json they kind of feel like especially if you start getting into the um, situation where you know um, you have relationships that are like more than one to many um, it's really many to many then um, you know the json or like a no sql approach doesn't really work that well and so you're gonna have to make all kinds of like awkward like um, join calls and it doesn't really like scale well you know you're gonna have to do things like caching which is what you said to like kind of to help app performance because you definitely don't want to get stuck in like making multiple calls to the back end and then like having to like put them all together in the application yeah anybody else has um, any experience other than uh, dynamo db like any other no sql database experience uh, i am currently using cassandra for basically uh, uh, we have a time series data and we have to persist the time series data and it is we are using it as a key value store yeah okay and it, it's not a real time engine for us we don't care about uh, we just need something to persist quickly we are worried about the write latency here so we wanted to write quickly and exit uh, and eventual consistency is okay because the services which will come and read the persisted data happens a little later uh, after the data is consistent uh, so far you have not run into consistency issues time series data is typically the features for most of our machine learning models like forecasting models so this helps us in um, uh, cal like building some feature store we are currently designing a feature store for uh, uh, time series forecasting and cassandra is what we picked initially uh, to store all the time series information makes sense um you know and i think uh you know we can i think like that's part of like where this chapter is going right like just kind of what are like the best um solutions out there for like different projects um you know and i think like they start off with kind of like you know the mysql no and no sql approach but then later on uh you know like this wasn't in this chapter but i did note like there was another like um course that i was doing for system design that took a lot of interest in like cassandra and um explain the difference between that and you know some of the other relational databases or types of databases out there so um i think ramya yeah. quickly for you mm -hmm. uh so did you guys explore anything else other than cassandra um we briefly explored hbase but hbase is not truly a key value store it's just a columnar storage format uh, it's an sql with different columns stored distributed way uh, so we explored just hbase and cassandra and cassandra was a little lightweight than hbase for us to integrate into the feature store we are building mm -hmm. so we also looked at ease of integration configurability uh, and if it is just going to be time series it's uh, just a single column uh, or two column data time and uh, value at that time so we could use the key value store oh, thank you 
So it's not really um, relational data. So there's no, um, there are no multiple attributes and stuff. It's basically a simple key value or. Um, how yeah, how it's a simple key value. Like yeah, from a, in a tabular format, imagine it's just two columns. One column is time stamps and the next column is like some sensor readings, like temperature or pressure readings right. for those time stamps. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And um, I might have said relational databases, but I honestly do mean key value like as well, like, you know, because I know that we have Redis, and other things that are out there too. I just felt like for what I really wanted to say was like data modeling. That's actually the more correct term. Um, and like being, having like simple ways of doing storage. Um, so I wanted to also touch upon eventual consistency. So anybody has any experience like what that even like how why is that relevant for document DB? Um, so um, anybody has experience? I can speak about my experience. It is it's a trade off that we make. Um, so. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so basically what, um, in our use case, right? So what happens is um, like a, um, in Dynamo uh, DB at least, the way to fetch a record, a uniquely identify a record is by using, um, um, is by using a partition key and a hash key. So let's say you have your um, uh, email on uh, first name and last name as those two keys, right? But then you also want to look up based upon uh, um there um uh, let's say there's a use case where that came up or that came up later that you want to list users in a certain region right so with that kind of uh, uh, requirement the only way to fetch the records is to actually scan the table one by one so um it's a very inefficient way like if you want to do that operation list um, users in a particular location um, so what the solution the um, DynamoDB offers is um, you can have a, a mirrored table. It's called a GSI. It is like um, um, it is like another table. It basically maintains a copy of the um, of the records from the main table in in the uh, in the in it in itself. And in the GSI, you can redefine the hash key and the partition key. So you can say uh, in this GSI the partition key is a uh, region, right? So, um, and uh, the thing about GSI is it does not have to be a unique key. So um, you could just have Seattle and like a lot of people belonging in the Seattle region. Like you can, yeah, that's, that's a fast operation at that point. So the eventual consistency comes there. Um, the, the, the place where eventual consistency will play an important uh, role is that, um, whenever you update that table record, right, it will take some time for the GSI to catch up to that. So you won't get um, the most accurate results, but it will uh, ensure that the, uh, the operation that you're trying to perform is fast, which would have been very painful if you just scan the records and kind of filtered them one by one. This GSI table, Amelia, is it like one mirror table or it can be multiple mirror tables based on your multiple hash keys? Like you can hash on yeah. Seattle, hash on user. You can uh, have multiple. Key. There's a limit okay. though. I think there's okay. some um, some six or something per key or some per, uh, per table. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful how you, so with the DynamoDB, you provision um, the read capacity and write capacity. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that the write capacity that is uh, allocated for the table and the GSI is same because every time a read hap a write happens to the table, a write also happens to the GSI. Mm -hmm. But is your write will be blocking until all the writes are complete no, no. or it will just write to the main table and it will exit, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, that is a, that's a background job that DynamoDB handles. Okay. It's not, yeah, no, application doesn't see it. Okay, so um, let's, let's go on to um, the next page here, I guess, because I think we kind of talked a little bit about um, yeah. you know, this section. So I think we have a good handle on it. Uh, so we were kind of getting at many to one and many to many relationships. Um, and so, you know, like, uh, I think like I made some notes here, right? Like I kind of highlighted, um, you know, the, the issue is basically like when you have more like entities, you know, that require more um, complicated data, you know, associations between uh, one, you know, 
one entity and another entity, that's when you might want to start thinking about like doing like these many to many relationships. Um, and so just basically like they were saying here, like if you start saying things like text, greater Seattle area, philanthropy, right? If these are just text fields, um, you know, and that's it, then it's fine just storing them as plain text strings. But, you know, if you wanted to expand on what greater Seattle area really meant and like, you know, take advantage of having lots of different geographic and regions and industries, um, even like just having like a, a drop down list of what greater Seattle area means, you might want to start thinking about like remodeling that data. Um, and the reasons why is right, like um, if you, you know, um, if it's text and you have to, you know, and if it's simple, then, you know, you're fine. But, you know, like if you have to like update like a whole bunch of regions that all point to greater Seattle area, it's much um, simpler. Like if, you know, it's uh, modeled better and you get like consistent style and spelling across profiles, avoiding ambiguity. Um, the name is stored only in one place. So it's easier to update across the board. Um, I wrote like a highlight here that, you know, um, when you store text directly, you're duplicating the human meaning information every record that uses it whereas if you have an id the id can remain the same in the background even if the information changes so an id just kind of you know is a point for a node <clears throat> and that's like something the computer itself like you know um keeps track of while we can change around all the other properties without having to worry about changing the data or changing where it's stored so um you know just if you start doing this, they kind of suggest that, you know, like you start approaching like a many to many relationship style. And ultimately too, it's good for like, you know, um, search and other things as well and localization. Um, does anybody have anything to add here? No, I think that's pretty clear. Yeah, what they're to say. Okay, cool. Um, so, you know, uh, then basically, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> it says anything meaningful that humans may need to change sometime in the future, right? And so, um, you know, if we use like no SQL style, right, then we have to duplicate that data and redundant copies have to be updated. And that can kind of like make, um, you know, it harder to keep track of like what all needs to be updated if you have like a no SQL, like or a multiple like duplicated database. Um, uh, and so you get like overhead um, risk inconsistencies where some copies of the information are updated, but others aren't. And so this is like another thing kind of to think about like when you're system designing, um, like how much duplication do you want? Um, in relation to databases, you know, like you want to have normalization, which just basically means removing duplication. Um, and so, you know, I think like we could also explore this little like tidbit here. Um, I'm happy to explore it kind of like right now or maybe down the line. Um, you know, just like he's asking here, what do you think? about normalization and denormalization. How much all do you have experience with that? It's not there in the actual hard copy of the book. Um, what does that link take you to? Um, let's see, I'll click this. <clears throat> Part three, derived data. Uh, oh, the last section or something. Okay, mm -hmm. oh, six, not one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's missed in the hard copy. Okay. Um, we can come back to it. Like, yeah, later. I didn't read it. So, yeah. Okay. So, one question before we go ahead, right? So, is this how localization uh, implemented in applications? Um, like, you persist the uh, the different language versions in DB and look it up according to that. Is that how localization is implemented in applications? Um. I wouldn't say like, you know, and I don't have, um, you know, like an example in front of me here, but like, I wouldn't say it's the only way I feel like, you know, they kind of say here that localization, um, like their approach is that basically like is a many to many relationship. Um, and so, you know, 
it's better to use normalization um, with localization um, because you know like then you can support other languages you can have um, one node that you can reference and then it can be connected to like a Japanese node or like a, a Spanish node or something with the same you know um, information fields that need to be updated and so then yeah. Um, so I thought the front end uh, uh, frameworks provided the support for rendering. Like, um, isn't that true? Yeah. Uh, there's a thing I remember called um, Use International. Let's see here. This is what we're using for React. I think they kind of changed the name. So I think it's called Format JS. Um, and so this is like one way of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, you use international. And then like you get like um like a piece of data like date and then um you have it connected to usually like a local file or a config or like some kind of like map and mm. then like it'll basically replace date with whatever um version you know like your site may be on like the us version or the um you know spanish version or the french version and stuff so here you can kind of see how they do this example here format this number and then this is the the output that you'll get so there are ways of doing internationalization on the front end too right yeah so you basically supply the strings for your different locales and then um, and then the framework will handle it for you right correct correct yeah, yeah. i can speak a little about it so what we used to do in a previous there was a third party provider mm -hmm. and if we are introducing any new strings the system, there was a backend service which automatically used to capture that these strings are not supported for right now, not supported. And then they used to feed them into the service and uh, we used to get the translations for it. But it used to happen with uh, like, it was sort of a, with every release, if there was any anything released as such, which was not, which for which the localization was not supported, there was a complete service that was responsible for it and was talking to an external vendor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, what kind of application? So basically, uh, you would control what text appears on your application, right? If it's like auto generated or some, some dynamically generated content, then you probably don't have a handle of how to translate it. But um, no. yeah, so they would, they would come to know about it because the service used to give error like there is no match provided for suppose i'm writing my name is akansha and there is no uh, like in, internationalization so the service will give error that this is a new string sort of right and uh, I, I cannot find a mapping for it so that's mm -hmm. how it was gotcha yeah i'm just here like sort of demoing like how we do it at work right like here we have these different country regions that you can say mm -hmm. you're in and then the entire site gets updated um, using this, you know, this library, like kind of, it's kind of like one of the tricks we use to basically kind of like handle localization. So this is um, pretty useful, you know, and it's all front end. Yeah. We already have the data to begin with, which yeah. is good. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to kind of just keep understanding like the best ways to do localization. <laughs> You know, so we do the same thing. We have a front end uh, that handles this. Yeah, and it makes sense because like these are like for some of this data, right? It's just pretty small. It's it's not huge, and there's not like like huge many to many relationships. It's all just kind of like you know typed out. Like okay, we just need to change headers or change paragraphs, and so like a lot of that can just be managed in like a simple like NoSQL or JSON document. So it's it's good for our purposes. Um, and then like, you know, the content comes from like a back end, like a CMS. And so they can update it on that side. And, you know, it's somebody like a content writer is updating it and that stuff can be updated and then, um, you know, pull down and then, you know, sort of like updated for this um, website in real time. So um, we're not doing anything like, you know, huge like graphs or anything like that on the front end, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we did was more on the back. This what I spoke was all on the back end side, especially the emails that are going out to the customers. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. 
So, um, so let's uh, let's see here. <clears throat> so I think we we kind of talked about you know like the um, duplication and normalization. And normalization is kind of like a big keyword. <clears throat> kind of like says, um, <clears throat> you know, normalizing data requires many to one relationships. Whereas many people live in like one particular region, many people work in one particular industry. It doesn't fit well into a document model, kind of like what you were saying, um, Amelia, like, you know, joins are not um, very good for NoSQL documents. And we, you know, like same thing too, like if we started needing complicated joins, um, the, the NoSQL thing is not gonna work for the internationalization project, right? So, um, you have to emulate the join. I highlighted, I made a note here as well. Um, and that requires multiple queries to the database. Um, and that slows down the application and you start having to think about like things about caching. Um, so like, you know, if he kind of talks about like where you might want to start thinking about the system design, like if you're working with organizations or schools or like things that have lots of, um, you know, um, entities and lots of fields and properties, um, maybe consider switching to um, a multiple, uh, a many-to-many -many relationship as opposed to one-to-many relationship or some kind of like JSON structure. Um, and then that way, like each organization, school or university could have its own, you know, um, fields like web pages, resumes. And so when those things get updated, then basically like um, the entire, um, you know, uh, the entire network of nodes or, you know, are in the many to many relationship are aware of like these changes, right? You don't have to go in and like manually update each one. So um, I, I felt like this was kind of like exactly what you were saying here. So I made the highlight here. Um, yeah, the question. So in application, uh, in document DB, in document DB, when we uh, are doing joins, in the application, so you're fetching one data from for one query and then fetching data for another query, and there is a necessity of join. You're joining in the application. Doesn't it make the system slow? How does it impact? Yeah. So <clears throat> let's say you have multiple calls to like some um, backend service that's you know document based, like MongoDB or something like. That. Like, then basically you have to you know make those fetch calls. That takes time, right? And then you consume them in your application then the application has to kind of go through each of those fields and figure out, okay, like which fields are need to be joined or, you know, like in MongoDB, I think like they're smart enough now where you can kind of like emulate the join. Let's see here. Um, so you can kind of like ask for that. And then maybe a little bit, um, I think like you have to kind of look at their API. I think they have lookup. I remember seeing that before. You have to study the API a little bit more and you can kind of get this to simulate a join but either way like if you do it in the application level yeah it's going to be a little bit of a performance hit um especially like so like if a lot of if like a couple hundred people are looking at the website it's not going to like do much right but if it's like there's a lot of load on the website like we were talking about like at the beginning of this book load then yeah like it's just um it's going to hurt like from machine to machine, right? Like um, it just depends. Like some users are going to have like a good experience if they have a good machine, other users, if they don't have that good of a machine or if they're on a smaller device or whatever, um, then, you know, they're going to have more of a performance hit. So you have to kind of look at like your, your median and then your like outliers and all that. I don't know if you remember all those, those charts, but um, it just depends. So especially if you're working in the realm of e-commerce, right? Like e-commerce, if people have problems with um, using the site and you have to do a lot of complicated joins, um, that's gonna hurt. So maybe e-commerce might be more, it may make more sense to do like a relational um, kind of database for e-commerce as opposed to like NoSQL. So in our case, right? Like, um, although we had to, um, we had this problem of doing multiple fetches, um, our uh, application had a very unique characteristic that 
um, the fetch on the other table used to happen on a very few records. Like there are a few big customers. So uh, we only needed, so those were the only records that were frequently fetched. Mm -hmm. So the pattern kind of lent itself for caching. So we, um, we were lucky that we didn't hit a um, dead end there. So we could just the like very handful, like maybe 10, we had a 10, um, maybe, maybe a few more than that enterprise customers who had uh, for whose records we had to fetch often. So we just cached them and that solved the problem. But yeah. I can see how it could have gone otherwise also then yeah, then we'll have to rethink. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of like, you know, um, a thinking, you know, these days, like a modern thing way of thinking is that, you know, um, if there are a lot of calls that you have to make, but the, you know, the data doesn't change that often, then just cache it, right? You know, if it's, um, again, kind of like something simpler like this, going back to the example, right? There's a chance that this content may not change that often, right? So why not cache it, right? Um, you know, uh, basically just in general, like these are always going to be like kind of sort of the same like fields shop, right? Sometimes it might change. So if it does, you know, we'll make that um, happen like once or like twice, like, you know, and then um, we'll put all that new data into a cache. And then like the time the person comes to the site, right? Like we do like, I guess it's called like a prefetch, right? Like if you use something like Next.js or, um, which is the technology we've been kind of looking into. You do like kind of prefetching, or you kind of like do, um, you know, this uh, um, getting the content in advance. Um, then basically, like what'll happen is um, you don't have to worry about like making that call again, like at runtime. It's already pre built for you. And so um, this is a pretty cool, you know, um, little like technology that I think is very modern and it helps for like client side rendering and stuff and handling data. So, um, so this is the uh, caching the, the browser, basically the, um, the assets or something like that. Yeah. The so there's like three main functions. Like you can um, get static props and then so you can make your API call in the background, get back the posts, right. And then it'll um, do this before, um, you know, going to production, right? This is like a um, server side called at build time. So when you build your, your development application in, you know, um, CICD, it'll make these calls and then get all that content. And then basically like when somebody comes to the site, a lot of the stuff is prefetched. So they don't even have to worry about like that fetch call and you don't have to worry about that fetch call or any performance hit. It's already done. Oh. And so so this, it, this is offered as a service, right? Like uh, CloudFront or something. The um, have you heard of AWS CloudFront? It that it does this basically. It kind of caches the the websites, so it can it, you can deploy it across different regions, so you mm -hmm. have low latency, and it also fetches content ahead of time, so you the users get a faster rendering. Yeah, yeah, pretty similar. I think Next.js is like um, meant for, you know, things like React, if you like building in React, whereas CloudFront is more is kind of like um, for the whole, you know, like, you know, HTML payload or like static content images. And yeah, that kind of is kind of like similar, right? AWS is like got like their, you know, um, like S3 buckets, right? Mm -hmm. That's like another solution for caching in advance because images don't change that often, right? And so when you're th thinking about building a site and, and you have images, um, especially like certain images, right? Like a header or like, you know, a, like a big carousel or something that it might change like a couple times a month. So, um, you know, just like, I guess uh, the previous company that I worked at, like, um, has the same you know rotating video like it hasn't changed for a year so s3 is like perfect for it right so um so yeah you you know i think like that's just part of it like when you're like starting to think about like um your yeah. system design but again like i'm kind of leading us back to this right like i feel like if you have something that does change a lot you know um then you're going to probably want to start thinking about like relational as opposed to like json documents um, 
you know, and like in the case of recommendations, I'm kind of like in the moment of like asking people for recommendations <laughs> in LinkedIn. Uh, you don't have to do that right now or at all. Like, I'm just like saying like down the line, like as I start looking, right. Or, you know, thinking about jobs, you also want to have recommendations from people. And so those recommendations need to update in real time. And so I thought this is kind of like a really good diagram of everything that we've been kind of like starting to talk about. You know, here's me, the user, right? And then here's Amelia and she's going to give me a recommendation. But, you know, like we don't want to hard code anything in a JSON document. So we want to make Amelia her own node, right? <laughs> and she has her own like positions and educations and jobs and things that she's been doing. And these are the organizations that she's connected to. But we have a connection too in that she gives me a recommendation. And so whenever her picture changes, we want to be able to see that update in real time, right? So this is like a scenario where, um, you know, you need a many-to-many -many relationship. Uh, does anybody want to say anything at this point? Is... No, that's good. Basically, saying many-to-many -many relationships, um, the document model is not, um, yeah, it's not great, so. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's the big takeaway is that, you know, like when you start thinking about like the system design of whatever it is you're building, whatever application you like, again, you know, if it's like simple content, maybe JSON makes sense. But if you're starting to like do something where it's kind of like more like relational in nature and you have like, like multiple users and they can have different things, then the way that they're going to get connected, JSON probably wouldn't work. So you would want to like state that especially at the beginning of a project um years ago that would have been hard to know because like mongodb was kind of like a brand new thing and so um people really didn't or like its claim to fame was like it could do everything that sql could do much better but now people are starting to understand its strengths and weaknesses um so what is the order of latencies that you guys see right like in the relational db uh, I'm assuming you all uh, reach out to the DB as a remote service, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so do you know what are the, like of what order your latencies look like? I'd have to look into that. I mean, like, I are you just kind of like asking in general, like, you know, um, like so how in, fast in, or slow it is or what? In, Di in our DynamoDB at least, um, so we have our uh, application and the database running in the same region. Mm -hmm. um, so with that setup, our uh, latencies are like very low, like okay. five milliseconds around that. So yeah. very, very impressive latencies. So I think we chose that, that. That's the kind of validation that we have that the data model and the DB choice we made is right um so yeah you mean to say Mulya, that the database and the application are all on the east side and versus what happens if the database was on the west and application servers are on the east something like that right that would yeah so it's it, that's a bad design yeah then you would have uh uh so basically what they say is, um, so D, D, so if, if that's what happened to you, then what you can do is you can have a DynamoDB, it actually offers and service that kind of syncs the uh, tables globally. Like if you have a primary region where your uh, majority of your uh, traffic comes, but you still have to host application in different regions, then it, can, it offers a service where it can kind of sync the tables again there is eventual consistency and all that that problems happen but um, it's not recommended to um, it's actually even designed hard to even write uh, application that talks to cross-region uh, services i mean it's it's not encouraged it's it's uh, yeah 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 um I, I again for my situation i'd have to talk to my api team but i assume like you know they're in the same region i think like we you know we would have the low latency in between like our you know back ends and front ends so um like i said i am in a position right now where i only see the front end <laughs> but like if i was working on the api team or like the back end service i could tell you about like how all that's stitched together um 
So this is your favorite part of my history. <laughs> yeah. History lesson. Um, so just basically. Uh, yeah, a quick point, like mm -hmm. long ago, I read a paper from Michael Stonebreaker. He's the god of databases, right? Mm -hmm. What goes around comes around. It's a, I think it's more than 30 pages, but the few sections of it, he goes off the history of various databases how the network model of last 20, 25 years ago came back today as a graph model. Yeah. It ties various stories together. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in history or even not interested in history, that would be like a quick peek into how the databases evolved over the years. So uh, I didn't hear the name. Could you say that one more time? Uh, what goes around comes around. What goes around? Comes around Michael Stonebreaker. Stone breaker, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. Yeah, uh, the first paper. Yeah. First paper. All right. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, can you post that um, in the chat? I'll put it in the notion so people. Yeah. Will... yeah for sure. Um, it's a long read, but it kind of gives a holistic picture. Okay. A article on history of databases. Thank you, Rami. Like, let me show you yeah. around. Yeah. R A M Y A. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. And then, like, I'll make sure I pin it so I read it too. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I guess like, like we got like a minute here, um, but I think this is a good section to just kind of like um, look at. I wrote some notes here that. Um, you know, like people have been thinking about like databases since the 70s, um, you know, with IBM keeping track of the Apollo space program. <laughs> um, so they used IMS um, and, you know, they use something called a hierarchical model, which is what JSON is really, really close to um, current day um, because it represents data as a tree of records. And this is where I like, you know, I kind of started talking about like why I started looking at data structures and algorithms again. Um, you know, just I started making notes again um, in my Notion application, which is something I have. Um, you know, like I just started doing like, uh, I think, let's see here, data structures and algorithms. Um, it should be, <laughs> I got to like remember where I put it. Um, so anyway, like I had a note here um, that basically like, the thing about trees, right, is that they're really good at, um, you know, finding stuff, especially if you have a, um, a tree structure that's, uh, you know, organized in like a, like a, like a priority way, or if you have like a binary search tree, um, you can get like kind of like these log and time returns. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah, so if I find it next time, I'll, I'll share that in here. But I felt like, you know, trees are really good ways of organizing data to begin with because you can get like um, lookups pretty fast. They're, they're only, the only thing that's better is an array because like an array, you get like instant lookups or arrays or hash tables. Those are like better data structures. But if you, and that probably makes sense for like key value pairs, but like for representing a lot of data, JSON's really good. Um, and then like, but as the data gets complicated, right, then you want to switch to relational, which kind of evolved from like the issues that people had with hierarchical and then eventually network, which I highlighted because relational also only is so good up to a certain point. Um, but network model today is the graph model, right? Which is what Facebook uses or like LinkedIn or like a lot of these big companies um, for managing lots and lots of people or looking up um, lots and lots of data. So like the, it's really fun to kind of just read up on the history and kind of see like how things started evolving from those like small data structures to like bigger data structures to relational to the network. And then um, if you go through the rest of this chapter here, right? Um, and we can go through it next time. They have some really cool like queries on how like they um, show you how to look up data, um, especially when it gets into um, like the declarative kind of um, queries and then the map reduce kind of queries. Um, and then finally um, the graph like queries, they're using things like um, 
the cipher language, right? This is what I wanted to just kind of quickly show cipher. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, and then, um, you know, like how they do it in SQL, but how it's kind of clumsy. Look at how much lines of code you need to do the same kind of call. Um, and then like they have like this, this looks like Ruby on Rails to me in some ways. I don't know if Ruby on Rails was inspired by it, but like they have this kind of like triple, um, right? Where you have like prefix, subject, uh, or action and then subject. So um, when we get there, that'll be fun. I just uh, wanted to just kind of like close this session out with, um, you know, some of my thoughts on that. Does anybody want to add anything before we go? No, I think we're meeting on Friday, right? Next? Yeah, Friday at um, 7.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Yep. All right. I'll think are we doing chapter two on Friday? How much is left? Um, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a big chapter, but um, okay. you know it'll go by um, relatively quickly. You know, so long as we just kind of you know. Um, I think at least read. more classes. Maybe next week will be done. Yeah, and then we'll go into chapter three, and then chapter four, and then keep going. So. Um, as always, like if there's something you felt like you didn't really get or you didn't we didn't cover, like you know, just want to like add to on the discussion, feel free to just jump in and put in this um, chat channel. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, so um, I mean, separate from this topic, right? I'm more um, interested in a book study of uh, the there's a book that Krishna had referred to, uh, coding craft or something. Do you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, if someone is interested, I can, um, I would be, um, can I think, you send me the link, Amulya? Yeah, I'm actually, I, I'm actually preparing myself right now. So for interviews and stuff, so would love to. Okay. Oh, actually, yeah. Then, then what, um, uh, um, Vijay was suggesting makes us go ahead, Vijay. He was suggesting something. Oh, so I have two things to add here. So I did find the note and then like I found, so this is like how, um, I'm studying for data structures and algorithms. I wrote like some basic stuff about like time complexity, then essential data structures to know. Um, and then I started like kind of researching about like hash tables and trees and like why they're really good. I made a note here that um, binary search trees are great for searching because like they can find stuff in log in time. And so, um, then they also have the property of um, being balanced. Whereas like, if you need more specialization, you can get into these kind of trees. So I kind of felt like I was interested in just knowing like, how do like, you know, these JSON documents work, right? Like these document object models, uh, not, the, not the DOM, but like just like Mongo in, in general, like how are they doing those lookups? Um, Cause if you understand that, then it'll make more sense like as how things have evolved to like more relational and then um, graph because um, graph is kind of like the last big data structure that people have to learn like for this kind of you know interview topics so I just thought um, it's good to kind of like look at this again if you have the time and then as far as like books I think I have like a wish list that I keep track of for all of the books that we've been talking about so I think um, these are some of the ones that I remember Krishna kind of talking about if you want to take a screenshot here. Um, oh, there's no technical book that he um not I'm not able to find that though. Mm -hmm. I will post it in the WhatsApp group. Um, but um I feel like uh, every, every time I write some code, I feel like I always wonder if there's a better way of writing this. So I think yeah. if I read some good coding patterns kind of book, I think that will give me some confidence. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, let me know. This algorithms and all uh, talk to me in September. <laughs> uh, okay, so. no worries. Yeah. Um, I would say, I guess, like one other one maybe that um, Krishna probably recommended was um, the Martin Fowler series. I don't know if you're aware of that. Have you heard of Martin Fowler? If you're That's interested. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I read, I read this book. Yeah, he has a lot of good um, books in general about like um, writing great code and clean code and designing properly. And it ties together with a lot of the themes we've been thinking about. 
Yeah, I've read his refactoring book. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this one, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's see here. Let's do a quick search. Martin C. Fowler. Clean code, recommend. Yeah, clean code. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what. Mm-hmm. I'll put yeah. a link for that here. Yeah, anyone interested in uh, doing that? Mm-hmm. Read? Uh, Amelia, I can join for clean code, but what frequency? Like, I haven't. Uh, um, uh, maybe um, once a week. Um, like any. Um, let me think. Uh, I'll do what do yeah, you do? Yeah. What's the interest here? I was, yeah, I can. Uh, I'm also looking to improve the coding, refactoring, and all this stuff. I had, I may have a copy of Clean Code. I don't remember, but I haven't read it. Or uh, it was a little verbose when I started it, so I just stalled it for a while. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. yeah. So I want to put my energy on system design for yeah. the first couple of months. But once it is a little yeah. bit in a yeah. better shape, I want to start on the next books. Yeah. yeah. Sounds Make good. Sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.